Welcome everyone uh, to our 2021 Mehboobul Haq Distinguished Lecture Series uh, on behalf of uh, the Mehboobul Haq Research Center here at uh, the Lahore University of Management Sciences, the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, uh, the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, SERP, and the Institute of Development and Economic Alternatives, IDEAS. Uh, my name is Umair Javed. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in politics and uh, sociology at LAMS and a fellow at the uh, Mehboobul Haq Research Center. Uh, I will be moderating today's lecture with Shandana Khan Momand, uh, who is a research fellow at IDS, uh, where she also leads its uh, governance cluster. Uh, the aim of the Mehboobul Haq uh, Distinguished Lecture Series is to provide an opportunity uh, to audience in Pakistan and elsewhere to learn from the work of leading scholars uh, on 21st century global and, and national challenges. Uh, and uh, who better to speak uh, on those challenges today than our guest for, uh, and our speaker for today, uh, Professor James Robinson. We're extremely excited uh, to have him with us today. Uh, James Robinson is the Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy and the Director of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts. Uh, he is the author of the highly acclaimed books, Why Nations Fail, uh, Economic Origins of uh, Dictatorship and Democracy, and uh, more recently and relevantly to this talk, uh, The Narrow Corridor. He is, of course, a leading authority on political economy, comparative economic development, and institutions. And we are particularly excited to talk to him today about his latest work and how it connects to a range of political trends that we see in contemporary societies, including far-right populism, authoritarianism, and communal and factional violence, and most importantly, societal resistance to all of these uh, trends. Um, as Shandana will explain ahead, these are issues that are particularly relevant to the current moment across a range of South Asian countries, uh, and of course, uh, Pakistan as well. Uh, I'm going to ask Shandana to briefly frame today's talk before handing the floor over to Professor Robinson. Thank you so much, um, Umair. Uh, we organized this talk today because political polarization and with a democratic backsliding has emerged as a major global challenge and is increasingly being recognized as an important issue in the global south as well as the global north. So we've seen it in the US and in the Brexit vote in the UK, but we've also seen deep political polarization emerge in Pakistan, in India, and of course in countries like Turkey, Kenya, Spain, and Brazil. A major question before us is why do we see such similar patterns in such different countries? But there is also a recognition that differences across countries underpin this. In some parts of the world, it is the result of deep ideological divides, while in others it is based on social identity, which leads us to the question, of course, of why society and states in different countries and states behave so differently. This is a major question for social scientists, but also for policy actors and all those concerned with governance and development. And as we know from his books, it has also been of great interest to our speaker today. What does the evidence tell us? How should we frame these issues? We are incredibly lucky to have Professor James Robinson with us today to help us answer these questions by speaking to his book, The Narrow Corridor. James will present his work for the next 35 to 40 minutes, after which we will open for discussion, um, drawing on questions from us, the moderators, and also our audience that's watching live today. Um, please post your questions through the chat function. And um, over to you, James. OK, good. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Let me, um, very happy to be here. Let me share my screen. Uh, and if I can, all right, no, no, all right, here we go. Okay, great. So, 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 so I'm going to, I'm going to talk about polarization, but, but I'm not sure I completely understand it. So we'll, 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 or where it, I, I think I understand some of the consequences. I'll talk about that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure I understand where it all comes from. I think we all have some ideas about that, which we can discuss, but I'm not sure how satisfactory they all are, to be honest with you. Uh, anyway, uh, so at least like for me, I can't, it's difficult for me to think about things like this without having some kind of framework to, to discipline my ideas. Or, uh, uh, and and that's, that's in some sense what we provide in this book, The Narrow Corridor. So let me just talk about that for half an hour and at least it'll, it'll show you where I'm coming from. So what's the, what's the book? What's the book about? Uh, you know, there's different ways of saying that, but 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 here's the simple way of saying it. The, the the book is founded on sort of two claims, you know, and the first, you know, which one might think of as being more controversial than the second, 
is humans want to, humans aspire to live in liberty and by liberty i mean i mean a very traditional uh notion of um uh liberty and here's you know here's a here's a quote from john locke's second treatise of government what's liberty well according to locke it's it's uh, someone is in liberty has a you know or lives in a state of liberty when when they're in, they have perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they see fit without asking leave or depending on the will of any other man. It's a sort of sexist definition. But, but, but so this is a classic definition of sort of negative liberty. You know, you're at liberty when you have freedom, you know, to make your decisions and do what you like you know, without asking, being, being under the sway of somebody else or have, without having to ask permission from somebody else, at least to the extent that what you do doesn't infringe on the liberty of somebody else. Okay, so, so, so the first claim in the book is sort of, you know, that's a general thing about human beings. Human beings would like to live in liberty, and I guess that's something, you know, we could discuss empirically. The second claim is that, you know, is much less controversial, which is, you know, whatever your evaluation of liberty, there's a huge amount of variation in the extent of liberty in the world. And in some sense, the book is really trying to propose a, a framework or a theory for thinking about that variation and trying to understand where all that variation comes from. Okay, so, so, so let's let's start thinking about the variations because once you start thinking about the variation some some theoretical ideas will suggest themselves so one thing which was evident to lock you know is that liberty is not going to emerge in a situation where the state dominates society you know so what's an example of that well if you've been in uh Tiananmen Square recently in Beijing, you'll see, well, not just in Tiananmen Square, but all over China, there's millions of these face recognition, these cameras going up everywhere. So, so you know, and uh, this is, I like this photograph because you've got Chairman Mao in, you know, on in the, the old imperial city in the back. Uh, you know, when George Orwell wrote his famous book, 1984, and he talked about Big Brother is watching you. It wasn't technologically possible for Big Brother to watch you, but now it is, and 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 he or she is trying to watch you in China. So the Chinese are constructing this incredibly elaborate system of monitoring and evaluating citizens to control them more effectively. So this is not a situation with very much liberty along the lines I defined it. So that's something that would have been clear to uh, Locke, but you know you could say. OK, hold on a second. That's right. But it can't possibly be the whole story. <clears throat> in fact, you know, it's a quite extreme situation in the current world and maybe in world history where the state dominates society in this way that it does in China. OK, take take you could say a polar extreme, which is a society with an incredibly weak state or almost a state which is absent, like Yemen, for example. OK, so Yemen is a society where it's not that the state dominates society, but society is very powerful and it's very organized through lineage and descent groups. And it's also armed, you know, so here's, here's a group of young men, you know, in the north of Yemen, these beautiful mountain uh, villages. They all have a dagger, you know, so every, men have a dagger. You get a dagger when you sort of come of age and then you get bigger, different sorts of daggers and people are people are armed. You know, in fact, Yemen, you know, it's here's the famous German sociologist Max Weber, and he defined, you know, he proposed a definition for the state, which is very commonly used in social science, which is the state is that human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of violence within a given territory. But in Yemen, it's not the state that has a monopoly, <laughs> a legitimate monopoly of violence. It doesn't have a monopoly of violence at all, and it's not clear how legitimate it is, but society certainly can legitimately use violence. Okay, so this is a, this is a very different world from the one that Weber had in mind. OK, so this is I'm, I'm trying to suggest this is almost the opposite of the Chinese case. It's it's not that the state dominates society. It's that society dominates a very weak and circumscribed state. OK, so 
what what goes on in is that what it does that create liberty so when i was talking about china i sort of said you know in a very straightforward way that john locke would have understood that doesn't create liberty what about what about yemen well you know one source there's not much liberty in Ye yemen either but for very different reasons than than in china so the first would have been again you know familiar to locke and 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 and, and thomas hobbes that other great 17th century political theorist hobbes talked about the absence of a state as leading to a situation he called war, W-A-R-R-E in the sort of archaic spelling, the archaic spelling. So a situation of war was, you know, where the life of man, again, sexist, uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. OK, so that that that, you know, there's a civil war in Yemen at the moment and 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 with with horrible consequences uh, for the society. But even before. The civil war you know if you read it if you read an ethnograph ethnography of yemen you'd see that it wasn't quite like hobbes depicted it but there was a lot of violence uh occurring in society feuding conflicts uh so so that was of a type that that's a type of a liberty that 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 hobbes or Locke would have understood but it's not the only it's not the only source of illiberty because what you tend to see in most societies like that, like Yemen or many places in Africa where I've worked, is that when the state is very weak like that, society can be powerful, but but there could nevertheless be many conflicts and tensions and 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 so various types of norms and practices emerge to to control that and limit that. And in the book, we argue that that's also a potent source of illiberty in the world. So it's not just this kind of Hobbesian war, but also what we call the cage of norms that, that enormously it, it, it inhibits people's uh, liberty. Okay, so, so, you know, you can see why liberty is hard to create now. If the state dominates society, you get what we call in the book a despotic Leviathan. I'm not sure I like, I'm not sure I like the terminology, but anyway, you know, if the society dominates the state, then then it's the other way around, okay? Uh, and the idea of the book is that, well, in the middle, perhaps there's a situation where state and society is balanced, and, and here's the diagram. Uh, in the middle, there's what we call a narrow corridor, hence the title of the book, where there's a balance between, on the vertical axis, the power of the state, and on the horizontal axis, the power of society. When these two things are balanced in this narrow corridor, that's when liberty emerges. So that's the argument of the book. And this diagram, you know, we're all academics and students and people like that. So I can dwell a little bit on the on the diagram. Uh, and and you know, and there's there's several re reasons for having the diagram. You know, one is it shows you that there's three these three different outcomes, which is a focus of a lot of the analysis of the book. Uh, it emphasizes, and this will come out in the sort of historical, in a very kind of condensed historical narrative I'll talk about in a minute. You know, it emphasizes much better than our earlier work that that attaining a situation where what we what with what we're attaining a situ a type of society that creates liberty, what we call the shackled Leviathan, is a process. You know, it's something that goes on in this corridor. It's a process. And that's where polarization is going to come in because polarization in society can seriously disrupt this process, I'm going to argue, okay? But it also suggests that, you know, these differences are large. You know, if you thought about the difference between, you know, Yemen or China, or, you know, where do I think there's a shackled Leviathan, let's say, you know, North America, it's, it's, it's been touch and go the last five years, as you probably noticed, but, but, but that's also gonna be interesting, right? Whoops, uh, you know, that, 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 What's interesting about the diagram is to sort of suggest that it's meant to suggest that these differences look very dramatic and large, but they're the outcome of a kind of dynamic path whereby the initial conditions uh, can be quite similar. You know, it's not that there are these big differences in political institutions and the extent of liberty and the dominance of state over society or vice versa because of some large kind of structural factors like rainfall or you grow rice or something like that this is actually the cumulative outcome of a of a process that i'm going to talk about now okay so 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 let's let me pose that question and sort of 
let me start talking a little bit about why is it that some parts of the world are in this corridor or got into the corridor and others aren't, okay? So, so and we have one long chapter, which is about uh, Europe. And, uh, and, you know, let me kind of get into that by, by quoting, strangely enough, the Roman historian Tacitus. So Tacitus, wrote a book called Germania, which was an almost ethnographic attempt to think about German society. You know, the, the Romans had a very difficult time with the German tribes. Uh, they couldn't conquer them militarily. And so Tacitus was very interested in why they were so successful and so resilient to, to being conquered. And he talks about their political institutions. And he says, you know, uh, over matters of minor importance, the chiefs debate. On major affairs, the whole community, the assembly is competent, competent also to hear criminal charges, especially those involving the risk of capital punishment. These same assemblies elect, among other things, magistrates who administer justice. So what Tacitus emphasizes is the incredibly participatory element in these Germanic tribes, and particularly assemblies. And, and, and. so what happened when the Western Roman Empire collapsed? Uh, some political entrepreneurs, particularly this gentleman here, Clovis, on the left here, he's being baptized. You know, he was a heathen. He and his army converted to Christianity en masse and he was baptized. What Clovis did was he took these very participatory institutions of the Germanic tribes and he fused them with late Roman state institutions, administrative institutions, fiscal institutions, not, not so successfully, but, but, but the church, legal institutions uh, you'll see in a minute how that works out okay and and he so he took these participatory institutions and he merged them with late late roman state institutions late, the romans didn't have these assemblies and things like that the senate had withered away by this time and and so so in our view this is a kind of moment where where these societies kind of get this balance between state and society Okay, and that starts this process. Here's, you know, here's the first, um, here's the oldest written description we have of, a, of an assembly. It's a, it's a, he started the Merovingian dynasty and that was followed by the Carolingian. This is actually a later, it's a Carolingian assembly. And what's striking about it, at least for us, is to the extent to which it, the description mirrors Tacitus's uh, description, you know, uh, uh, Two general assemblies, same as in Tacitus. Uh, the low, those of lower station were present in order to hear the decisions and to deliberate concerning them and to confirm them not out of um, coercion, but by their own understanding and agreement. So these assemblies were institutionalized into this Merovingian and Carolingian state. Now Clovis, one thing Clovis did was he promulgated a law code, the famous Salic law. And here's uh, one of the existing prefaces to the Salic law, and it's extremely interesting, okay? It says, therefore, four men, uh, Wizogast, Aragast, Saligast, and Widogast, it says like Lord of the Rings or something, they came from beyond the Rhine, they were Franks, so they were Germans, they were beyond the Rhine, coming together in three legal assemblies and discussing the origin and cases carefully, they made judgment as follows. So, Clovis might have promulgated the law, but he didn't write the law. It was written by these legal assemblies. Okay, so this was a very bottom up process of codification of norms and rules. And it wasn't some top down kind of law giver. And I think this reflects very well this type of equilibrium that we think uh, emerged. Uh, running through hundreds of years of history, you know, here's his, uh, I know Shandano sitting in, in, in Britain, you know, and I'm, I'm English, you know, so, 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 so how, did, how did this work out? I was talking about Germany and the Franks and France, and how did that work out in England? Well, well, this is a, you know, this is typical English kind of overstatement, the birthplace of modern democracy. This is Runnymede Meadow, just west of London. And Runnymede Meadow, as every British schoolboy and schoolgirl knows, was the place where King John signed the Magna Carta in 1215. So this is this sort of very famous constitutional document uh, 
which established various types of principles in Britain, which, you know, supposedly, or England at the time, supposedly, you know, are still maintained. So, 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 but let me just point out one thing about this. I don't want to talk about the Magna Carta. I want to point out how significant it is, you know, that it was done here. So why, why did they do, why did they negotiate it in Runnymede? You know, why there? Well, it turns out that this meadow was the place where the Anglo-Saxon Witten used to meet. So 1215, King John, you know, King John was basically French. You know, he was a Norman, the Normans had invaded, but the Normans had reproduced an enormous amount of the underlying institutions because that was their claim to legitimacy. And the Witten was the Anglo-Saxon version of the Frankish assembly, the Germanic assembly, because the Saxons after all were Germans, they brought that into England. And so why did King John do it there? Because this is the legitimate place where you negotiated and these processes took place, okay? So, so, but this, the Magna Carta is an interesting moment because this is not some people getting together and agree, you know, like this was a very confrontational thing. So the idea in the book is that this narrow corridor once you're in it, maybe that's through negotiation or by chance in this case, or maybe, you know, but staying in it is not some, it's not just a kind of clever constitutional design. It's, it's, it's a process. It's a contest. It's, it's, it's the society and the state in, you know, fight to stay and keep and control. And, and you know, and that's where polarization is going to come in. And, and one of the best descriptions by a social scientist of what we think of as this process, <clears throat> which I'm gonna put a name on it in a minute, I'm gonna call it the Red Queen effect, is actually by the great sociologist, Charles Tilly. So Tilly wrote a fantastic book called, the, the it's called Popular Contention in Great Britain. And he was interested in the sort of, the evolution of mass collective action in Britain from the middle of the 18th century through to 1833, 1833 is a very significant date because it's one year after the first Reform Act where something like modern democracy starts getting established in Britain. And what Tilly noticed in this period, what's fascinating for him is that a new variety of claim making took place. Mass popular politics took hold on a national scale. So he observed society started organizing very differently. New types of association and organization institutions emerged society started acting on a much larger scale and complaining about different things. Instead of complaining about parochial things like the price of bread was too high or, or, the, or, or, or the butcher was charging too much for meat, it started complaining about the system, about you know, how, how things were organized in a much different way. And what was it that led to, and that, you know, for us, that's, that's, very, that's a process of society getting stronger. What was it that led to that, the expansion of the state pushed popular struggles from local arenas and from significant reliance on patronage towards autonomous claim making. So it's exactly the state getting stronger, the state penetrating society. This is when, you know, this is, this is you know, John, John Brewer, this is from John Brewer's great book, The Sinews of Power about the construction of the modern fiscal state. Suddenly for the first time in English history, there were tax collectors in your face. This is, I love this map. It's the revenue round in, you know, June and July of 1710 of Supervisor Cowperthwaite. You know, it's a great Saxon name. Supervisor Cowperthwaite, you know, what did he do? He was going around checking, checking production of beer, checking the production of bread. They were levying excise taxes. Suddenly the state is in your face for the first time and society reacts. That's what Tilly's talking about. So the state is trying to control you. It's trying to tax you. It's trying to regulate you. It's trying to see how, what you're doing. And society is saying, no, no, I, that, I, that's scary. We need to control that. And we need to organize to control that. That's, that's the contest. But, but that contest, you know, is very productive when it leads to compromise. It leads to the 1832 Reform Act. It leads to more institutionalized ways of representing people's preferences and representing their ideas and giving them more accountability and leverage onto the state. But that needs, that needs compromise. It needs negotiation. It needs, and that is what polarization uh, destroys or threatens to destroy. Okay. So we call this the Red Queen effect, this, 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 this competition. This competition can be very productive. It creates strong states and strong societies, but, but it can also spin out of control. And I guess that's 
that's that's the message you know when i think about how does polarization fit into this polarization is something that makes it very difficult for this red queen this competition to be productive because that's you need negotiation and compromise for that okay so 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 that's you know so so what about china i talked about china you're thinking oh you know china let's so let's go you know the interesting thing about china if you go back in history far enough and you know this is this is this is a lot this is before the this is a very famous uh, chinese uh, philosophical work the hunzi this is before the emergence of the first dynasty you know and here's uh, you know his I, I don't know how good your chinese is but it's 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 at least as good as mine uh, here's a famous expression uh, from, uh, from the hunzi and it, you know he says the king is a boat the common people are the water. The water can hold up the boat, or the water can sink the boat. So it's actually a statement about accountability. You know, the king is a boat, and the people can hold it up, or they can sink it. You know. So the interesting thing about China is if you go back prior to the sort of first dynasty, there's all sorts of assemblies and mechanisms of accountability, and but it, then it gets sort of snuffed out. Uh, by 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 you could say an intellectual or a cultural revolution here's one of the founders of that one of the founders of the so-called legalist school of philosophy lord shang or shang yang when the people are weak he said the state is strong hence the state that possesses the way strives to weaken the people okay when the people are weak the state is strong so the legalist school of philosophy, which heavily influenced the first Qing dynasty, was a very different thing from the Frankish state. It was a sort of top-down, micromanage. If you look, there's we don't have any of the Qing legal codes left, but we do have subsequent legal codes. And what they suggest is that Han legal codes, for example, is that this was a sort of top-down micromanaging type of state. This is not a bottom-up codification of social norms. It's a kind of straitjacket for society to weaken the people, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, I won't get into the way, you know, uh, the virtue, this is the, this is the way to, to attain virtue, interestingly enough, okay? But, but the point is, you know, glossing over thousands of years of history, we, a, we, we talk, we try to sort of tell a bit of the story in China, is that, this is the same mentality they have in China today. You know, this is the same as I showed in Tiananmen Square at the start. When the people are weak, the state is strong. That's what President Xi thinks. He thinks the state has to be strong. And for the state to be strong, the people have to be weak. So we have to strive to weaken the people. And, you know, and, and that's what they're doing. You know, so, 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 you know, what are those cameras feeding into? They're feeding into something called the social credit system, which kind of evaluates how good a system how good a citizen you are and you know takes points off you if you do bad things and gives you points if you do good things and if you're too bad you can't buy a train ticket or you can't you know there's all sorts of you know so this is this is an enormous affront to liberty you know let, you know i could say one make one comment i said at the start you know the the empirical claim in the book is that everyone's interested in liberty uh you know, there's a debate in amongst social scientists about whether Chinese people are happy with this or not, or whether Chinese people really value liberty in this kind of Western sense that I defined it. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, I'm just sort of emphasizing that at this point. Okay, so, so, so that's, you know, so, so think about that Chinese situation and think more, I want to think more about the kind of underlying mechanisms here that create this divergence between these different type of state society relations and and you know one mechanism that we emphasize a lot in the book which i guess i you know i've sort of seen a lot from my own work in sub-saharan africa is is you know if you anticipate that these dynamics between states and society are going to create something like a despotic leviathan then you might be very concerned to stop that in its tracks and i think many things about you know the long run political development of africa for example can be explained exactly by 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 this you know by by a kind of antagonism towards power why is there an antagonism towards power because 
because people want to be autonomous, they want to be free, they want to be, they don't want to be under the control of a despotic Leviathan. And so you need to kind of stop that happening. So we give many examples of that. I, 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 I how, how, how long should I talk for? How long do I have left? What's optimal? Another 15 to 20 minutes. Oh, okay, I've got lots of time. Okay, good, I can tell you about Nigeria then. All right, so, so, so I, I just want to give you more of the, the idea of what the mechanisms are driving this, you know, so, 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 you know, and so let me, I'll do that with a little story, if you like, from Tivland. So where's, where's Tivland? So, so, you know, this is an ethnographic, this is a very crude ethnographic map of Nigeria that you shouldn't take terribly serious, but te ter terribly seriously, but, but, but the Tiv uh, here around the Benue River, that's Makurdi in eastern, eastern Nigeria, the Tiv people uh, live there. And, and, you know, why, why, why are the TIV interesting to talk about in this context? Because the TIV were an example of what an anthropologist would have called a stateless society uh, prior to the British colonialism. And two anthropologists, Paul Bohannon and his wife, Laura Bohannon, was, were, were particularly interested in the mechanisms that, you know, why, why, you know, why, why is it that the TIV, did, didn't the TIV understand that having more centralized political institutions would be advantageous in terms of you know, providing public goods. And if they did understand it, why didn't they create such institutions? So, so, so the Bohannons are very interested in that. And in one uh, article, Paul Bohannon sort of describes these mechanisms about why the state, why the TIB didn't have a state. And he does it in a very sort of interesting way uh, through a, a particular cult uh, called Nyambua uh, in the 1930s. And, and uh, Nyambua was, there was a gentleman called Kokwa who was selling charms, okay? So you could go to Kokwa, you give him some money and, you know, and he would, you had to drink something and he'd give you a fly whisk to detect uh, witches in effect. You know, here's a photograph that Bohannon took. Here's a Tiv diviner. You could think of Kokwa was a diviner. And here's a fly whisk in, his, in the gentleman's left hand. And this whisk was used to, to kind of uh, find uh, witches. So to think about witches, uh, it's, it's, it's important to understand this word sav in, in Tiv society. So sav means uh, power, in particular, power over other people, you know, sort of charismatic power. You know, I used to, when I, te when I used to teach at Harvard, I'd always give the example of Larry Summers. You know, you know Larry Summers, a favorite, the famous economist who was the, president of Harvard for a while. He was a guy with a lot of sav. You know, he was, he, 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 had, he was very charismatic. He could get other people to do what he wanted. Okay, he walked into a room, everybody would sort of look at him, you know. So, so that was a man with sav, okay? But the thing about sav is that there's two ways to acquire sav. Some people are just born with it, but it can also be acquired illicitly through cannibalism and eating corpses, okay? So Bohannon says, you know, a diet of human flesh makes the salve, and of course the power grow large. Therefore, the most powerful men, no matter how much they're respected or liked, are never fully trusted. They're men of salve, and who knows? You know, Larry Summers, who, who knows? I, who knows? You know, you just... So, so straight away, somebody who's charismatic or, you know, how, do, how does political hierarchy emerge? You know, somebody charismatic or powerful or particularly skilled, you know, in anthropology, there'd be this notion of a big man, you know, somebody, hierarchy starts emerging because of this, you know, but this immediately gets stopped in its tracks because, because, oh, you're, you're a big man in Tiv society, you could be, you could be eating, you could be a cannibal, and, you know, this is, the, you're using witchcraft to become more charismatic, and that's a problem, okay? Now, people with Sav belong to an organization which, they call them Batsav, okay? And, and Batsav has two meanings, powerful people, the, the plural of Sav. But it simultaneously means, you know, a group of witches organized for nefarious purposes, like robbing graves to eat the corpses. So, so this is something like, you know, Bohannon points out, this is something like the word politician having two meanings. You know, politician could be, you know, a politician could be someone who competes for, uh, to, to, to attain government office. Or the word politician could sim simultaneously mean 
uh, a group of which is organized for nefarious purposes. You know, so, so there's this sort of double entendre, which is always kind of pushing people away from power and authority. Okay. And, and in the end, you know, Bohannon says, men who acquired too much power were whittled down by means of witchcraft accusations. Nyambu was one of a regular series of movements to which TIB political action, with its distrust of power, gives rise to so that the greater political institutions, one based on the lineage system and the principle of egalitarianism can be preserved, okay? So I think what you see, you know, Jan van Sina, who was the sort of great, histor great political historian of um, Central Africa, who sort of more or less invented the modern political history of Sub-Saharan Africa through his use of oral sources starting in the 1950s. Van Sina's whole theory was based on this idea of, you know, the genius of Africans is that they, they, they were able to innovate different ways of governance, which provided public goods and coordination, but without creating these tyrannical states that you see in Eurasia, okay? And, and so, so I think, uh, you know, this example is supposed to sort of explain, I don't, I, I've read quite a bit of the ethnography of Yemen, but I've never found such a clear, I don't know about Yemen, I've never worked in Yemen, but, but one might imagine that that's also a problem that you have these very strong lineage and descent groups. It's very difficult for them to see you could construct a more effective centralized state in Yemen without enormously jeopardizing their autonomy. Uh, all right, so, so that's the, you know, that's the, you know, so let, let me say a little bit, let me close by, you know, so there's, you know, there's a bunch, there's many implications of this. You know, one thing that in the picture, of course, which I didn't emphasize before is that, you know, it's not actually, it's not actually, you know, despotic societies that have the strongest state. So you could say in this picture, you know, one of the empirical claims that we talk a lot about in the book is actually it's not, the state isn't strongest when society is weak. The state is strongest when society is strongest. Why? Because it's this competition between state and society that creates both a stronger state and a stronger society. This thing I call the red queen effect is this competition. But if the competition disappears, then the state doesn't really have to accumulate strength to control the society. Society is like, you know, prostate. So, 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 so then the competition ends, but it's that competition in our view that creates strong state. In this one little example I gave from Tilly, it's, it's the state competing with society that, in, the state becomes stronger, it builds institutions in order to control society, and society fights back in order to get that thing under control. But, but, but that has to be institutionalized, and, and, and that's where polarization comes in, you know, and polarization also comes in, you know, we have, I, I can't get into it here, but we have a lot of discussion of, you know, how is it that different societies get into this corridor historically, and in some cases clearly where societies manage to negotiate their way into it, okay? And to do that, again, you need to build coalitions, you need to negotiate, you need to make compromises, and that you can't do when society is polarized. So if I was gonna think about, you know, democracy and polarization, obviously, again, I haven't talked very much about that. I was talking about, you know, the ancient history of Western Europe, but, you know, it's not a coincidence that Western Europe is full of all these parliaments, for example. Where did they come from? The Germanic tribes. You know, they came from the Carolingians. They came from the Germanic tribes. So, so this political evolution, you know, in our, in our view, democracy emerges out of this, out of this institutionalization of the power of society, out of the institutionalization of these assemblies and participation and accountability. So that's something that emerges in this corridor. It's not something that emerges in despotic leviathans, and it's very difficult to institutionalize in what we call an absent leviathan, where you don't have centralized state institutions. So it's very hard to, and power is local and autonomous and fragmented, and, and it's difficult to, to organize, you know, something that we think of as, as democracy in, a, in, a, in a, at least, you know, in, a, in an institutionalized Western way. So democracy emerges in this corridor, but but it's fragile when society becomes polarized because the competition starts 
getting unstable and it's not possible. The world's always changing. Technology's changing, globalization, you know, the world changes. And when the world changes, you need to make new institutions and build new institutions and make new compromise and abandon old ones. And when society gets polarized, that becomes very difficult to do. And that risks you falling out of the corridor. So, so one of the chapters in the book specifically discusses societies, you know, obviously I'm talking about one and a half thousand years of history in the European case. Uh, there's enormous amount of path dependence here. You know, it's, there's a huge amount of path dependence. But I think what we discuss is how, what you do see in many cases, particularly in Europe, is that there are moments where a society can sort of crash out of the corridor because of intense polarization. So the Nazi state, for example, you know, in the 1930s and 1940s would be a fantastic example of that. As a social scientist, what I find fascinating about that is that, you know, despite all the kind of madness of that period, what in retrospect looks like madness of that period, when it crashed, the Germans were able to come back to some consensus about how society was supposed to be organized and they got back into the corridor. So what we emphasize in the book is that these periods where these societies, we focus you know, on these European societies, I mean, the Prussian state also, you know, you could say before the Napoleonic period is another interesting example of that, where, where particular dynamics at the end of the Thirty Years' War push a society out of the corridor, and then it comes back into it, you know, so the long, you know, so this is the, this is the long run pattern, but I'm just kind of emphasizing here that there's a lot of volatility, there can be a lot of volatility in this pattern of the German case is an interesting example. And of course, you may only be outside the corridor for 15 years, but the 15 years the Nazi state was outside the corridor created a staggering amount of misery and violence in the world. So that has huge consequences for so the fact that it's a temporary thing do doesn't mean one should be complacent about it because those temporary things create a vast amount of misery and violence and suffering. But, but so, you know, one could focus on different things. One could focus on these long run dynamics and that's mostly what the book is about. But we also discuss these deviations. And I think what we discuss in a, there's a chapter in the book called Red Queen Out of Control is that it's polarization exactly that lays the ground for this Red Queen effect basically falling apart and society jumping out of the corridor. So let me let me stop there. And, and is, that, is that a good moment to stop? That's perfect. I did misspeak earlier. This is exactly the time that you had. So it's exactly on time. Right. Thank you so much. And that's really fascinating. Your idea of state is strongest when society is strongest is so powerful. And, um, and it relates to so much of our, of our conviction around the fact that it's really state citizen engagement that's so important to democratic practice and the back and forth and the tug and pull um, that, that goes with that. Um, I do want to jump um, immediately to a question on polarization, but I'm going to park that for a second because in, in reading through Nar Narrow Corridor, and this question won't surprise you at all, the one thing that, um, that I kept thinking back to was, of course, your own earlier work on colonialism and the effect of colonialism. And I'm trying to, and I've been sort of trying to figure out how to connect your arguments here with your earlier arguments on the role of colonialism and the conditioning of state institutions that happened under colonial conditions. So of course, you've talked about this as the colonial origins of development, but you've also yeah. talked about it, about the struggle between, um, for example, in India, you know, holding post-colonial democratic institutions to coexist with um, with, with the, the politics of caste identity. You've also talked about examples of this, of the creation of a chieftaincy as a central role, of having a central role in governance in Africa. So there's all of these moments of sort of the impact on the creation of institutions that are essentially post-colonial traditions. But we now hear a lot more about the importance of pre-colonial traditions as well. And I was just wondering about um, the extent to which these two um, talk to each other. I mean, how does this sit with your own earlier arguments about the influence of colonialism? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fantastic question. You know, I would say there's different ways of thinking about that. You know, one, one way of thinking about it is, you know, there's a sort of world systems perspective here in the sense that 
one reason you know some countries are outside the corridor is because other countries are in it you know that in some sense you know it was what turned into the kind of colonial western colonial powers that sort of within the corridor you know developed these more effective states and they developed more effective technologies military technologies and also you know hegemonic ide ideologies you know uh, which which allowed them to kind of create this, 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 these colonial societies and sort of pitched, you know, pitched other societies into, you know, into very different sorts of, of equilibria. So, so I think, I think that, I mean, I didn't mention that in the talk, but I think that's one way of thinking about this is that there's a whole equilibrium here. Like when I tell that story, it sounds like everybody's autonomous, you know, but of course they're not autonomous. They're interacting with each other. And in some sense, colonialism sort of made sure that some types of society were outside uh, the corridor. But I would also say, you know, I, I think it's a very difficult, you know, on the one hand, like I, you know, I, I, you know, I've worked for many years in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think, you know, I find it very difficult to, uh, to say anything very good about European colonialism in Sub-Saharan Africa. But I also think, it's easy to overemphasize the control, you know, the, the, the power of colonial, colonialism. I think one has to conceptualize, and it is maybe very different in South Asia, but just in Africa, I think one has to conceptualize correctly what was the impact of colonialism. You know, I did a lot of work, uh, I've done a lot of historical work in Sierra Leone, and um, I've actually been doing it in southern Nigeria the last few years with a historian friend of mine. And what strikes me is there's enormous amount of continuity you know in some sense i guess my current view is that's actually insulting to africans to think that they were sort of putty you know in the hands of england of the english people or so actually africans resisted you know africans manipulated the european powers you know africans you know and in rural sierra leone there were 26 english people you know who couldn't speak the language who didn't really understand the institutions you know i, I understand south asia you know that that's a much longer, it's much more historical, it's much deeper. But, but in some sense, the colonial control of Sierra Leone was a very peripheral thing. And so I think I probably changed my view. So there's much more emphasis, I would say, on the continuity of African institutions. And yeah, the Europeans, the British and the French, they created these ridiculous kind of arbitrary post-colonial states. And that's created all sorts of problems, you know, of devising a social contract and, and building institutions as a legitimate. But, but, I, but I think I would say, you know, that's two things I would say, that I've come to appreciate much more the historical depth of many uh, institutions. And I, you know, reading about South Asia, again, you know, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm also, I mean, you know, there's a lot of institutional depth there, like this whole idea of democracy and participation is very deeply rooted in South Asian history, very, it's a very history, very unlike China, you know, just this idea of a panchayat, you know, that's, that's a very historic thing. So I, you know, that's, that's also interesting. I mean, I, I don't think I'm enough of a scholar to really understand, you know, obviously, this is like the whole issue of caste, you know, we talk a lot about Ambedkar's work and about Ambedkar's ideas about how caste structured Indian society and how that also stops the Red Queen working in some sense but but you know obviously that's that's there's other scholars who are much more competent to talk about that than us we just we wanted to put those ideas out there just to sort of think about you know how does south asia or like india you know how does that fit into this framework um that that makes sense that's that's a really interesting um, I am sort of a re response to that. I think the length of colonial engagement for sure, but it's also the, the type of interaction, I guess, between different kinds of institutions and for how long they engage in the particular way. So you're right, I mean, there's there's so many nuances that keep us from being able to categorize it too, too, too broadly. Um, so yeah, that's that's great. Umer, do you want to ask the next question before I come Yeah, back? thank you so much. And I thank you, Professor Robinson, for, uh, for this talk and obviously for the work. Uh, that this is based on. So I think uh, the question that I have goes back to something that you uh, mentioned right at the start, which sort of acts as uh, sort of one of the fundamental assumptions uh, for this idea of a narrow corridor, which is this uh, human, almost an essentialist uh, desire for liberty uh, and, and how that sort of drives human activity and, and obviously the interaction of state with society. And I want to sort of 
not so much push back on it, but to sort of get you to sort of expand a little more on some of the ideational and, and sort of cultural drivers of what we, of how we can, of how societies conceptualize liberty. And you pointed this out earlier, which is that, you know, in the case of China, uh, it might just be the case that sort of, you know, Chinese, the Chinese conception of liberty perhaps doesn't square, you know, well with, with how we understand liberty in other contexts. And I think it's not just true for, for the case of China, but I mean, even if you sort of look at the history of, of, of a society where we do have the, where you do have the sort of shackle, you know, where we do have sort of the red queen effect and obviously uh, liberties in a conventional sense, such as, such as the UK, uh, you cited Tilly's work on claim making in the late 18th century um, as being driven by sort of, you know, an expanding state. So it's clear that the expansion of the state has had Im an impact on people's conception of liberty and people's ideas of, of what sort of claims they're supposed to make. When sort of, you know, Thompson's work on, say, the moral economy of the English crowd in the same century, uh, you know, talks about how there was still sort of an undergirding sort of, you know, idea of, of what people expected from local public authority, right? And so those ideas transformed over time to sort of, you know, from the price of bread and sort of the colliers protesting the price of bread to something that's much more concrete about how decisions are made and how public authority is exercised. So basically, you know, I mean, just to wrap this, this long winding question, I, what I would yeah. want you to comment on is, is what, how does this ideational change actually take place? Or do we have a way to model sort of this transformation of what conceptions of liberty look like, what conceptions of the state uh, exist in, in, in sort of people's head and, and how that might change over, over a longer period of time? Yeah, I think, I think that, so that's a great question. I mean, I think that um, when we first started working on the book, we were very interested in that set of questions. You know, you could say, when does the notion of the state, you know, in its modern sense, even emerge, you know, as a sort of concept or it sort of disentangles itself from religious notions, you know, and, um, and you know, and you, you know, you're exactly right that in some sense, there's a sort of co-evolute, I mean, in our idea, so we, we, we downplay that a lot in the book because I think we, I don't think we, we're, 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 I don't think we're scholars enough of political theory to actually really tackle that in a serious way. It's 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 something I spend a lot of time reading about at the moment. But I think you're absolutely right that there's a sort of co-evolution of ideas. And you know, in the in the in the you know, in this narrow corridor, as society changes and as the state changes people's ideas as kind of intellectuals, not just institutional innovation, there's intellectual innovation as well, you know, as society and state changes. And I, you know, what's the, what's the causal role of that? I don't know, but I think you're right to sort of say, well, that means you could endogenously in the Chinese case, for example, if you take into account this kind of, you know, there's intellectual change, then, then in some sense, you know, the intellectual change could be dominated by that emergence of the shackled Leviathan too, and somehow that would be rationalized. You know, that's in some sense what legalist thought and even Confucian thought does. You know, Confucian thought sort of rationalized this, this model of, you know, there's no notion of accountability. There's, there's this sort of emphasis on virtuous rule and, and, you know, and the way and, you know, and so, so that's, there's a sort of whole intellectual system surrounding that. And, and, and I guess, you know, the way I think about that is, I think that's right. I think that's right, which sort of, I say that weakens the claim one, but I also think it's sort of interesting, you, you know, if you, you know, if you think about Taiwan, for example, which is, you know, Taiwan is, you know, more Confucius than mainland China. You never had the cultural revolution. And the Kuomintang, you know, when they took over Taiwan to sort of differentiate themselves from the communists, they became more Confucius, you know, than Confucius. They, they, you know, so, 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 but what's interesting about that, you know, when I have a very good friend who teaches in, ta in Taiwan, is that, you know, what he pointed out to me is that if you read the Analects or you read many of these Confucius, Confucian writings, there's actually, there's a lot of flexibility and sort of nuance, you know, so, if you emphasize one part of the analects, you can say, oh, you know, the, the people do not, you know, discuss government, Confucius says. But then another part says, a government that's lost the confidence of the people cannot stand, you know. So there's other parts where are much more ambiguous about how society should be organized. So his view was that, 
what they did in Taiwan is, you know, they maintained this sort of very Confucian, but they started emphasizing different bits of Confucius. You know, so, so no cultural system is sort of completely hegemonic. You know, there's sort of wiggle room. And I guess that's where power, we would say that's where power comes in. So we, you know, Daron and I, Asamoglu and I, you know, we come out of this very materialistic kind of tradition in economics. You know, we've been struggling to kind of deprogram ourselves, you know, but it's very hard. I said, you know, it's very difficult once you, in the early in the youth, you know, this kind of crypto Marxism, which, neoclassical economics kind of incorporated into itself you know and 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 so so it's very hard for us to think about you know the sort of causal role of ideas and ideological innovation but i i think you're absolutely right to flag that i think we tried to tackle it but we didn't really think we were intellectually equipped to do it so we sort of went back to what we're more comfortable with but i i'd love to think more about that yes this is a sort of my confession yeah, for sure. No, I think it's a it's an interesting way of also uh, looking at institutional innovation as sort of being driven by by cultural innovation, and that explains yeah. sort of long term transitions, even not just long term, but also like medium term transitions uh, into and out of uh, out of the corridor itself. Right? And, yeah. and you know, and uh, we can obviously there's a lot that one can say, but you know, looking at cases like contemporary India and Turkey for that matter shows that this kind of sort of intellectual innovation has implications for the kind of institutional arrangements of power uh, yeah. that are developed and the relationship between state and society. Uh, sorry, Shandana, I'm, I'm sort of cutting into- no, no. I, 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 I'm complete, I completely agree with that, yes. Thanks, Umair. So I'm going to um, ask uh, one more question before we go to the audience. And this is this is my uh, I'm re this is the puzzle that I'm really hoping you can help us solve on polarization, which is uh, talking to a lot of what you've discussed in the narrow corridor is this puzzle that is about the fact that we've just discussed that countries have such different traditions. And also in your earlier response, you talked about the the, the greater nuances that exist in how institutions um, developed as well. Well, but at the same time, the sort of zero sum game that predicts polarization that you've spoken about is something we've seen emerge in very different countries, but it's emerged in fairly similar ways. So some of the similarities that we've picked up on is a, it doesn't seem to distinguish, as I said earlier, between the global north or the global south. But in, in the sorts of dynamics that we've been witnessing is this creation of enemies rather than political rivals and this, this zero sum conflict and the need to sort of deal with democratic practice in a way that doesn't repeat the game, that sort of stalls the game at some process and, and allows people to take over power more. These similarities, also the linkage with, with populism and using populist ideals for, for sort of entrenching polarization are fairly similar, but also then there's other similarities. I mean, you talk about the, Ve uh, the Weimar Republic and the, the, the use that elites made of military and, and bureaucracy, and that's something that was also in Turkey, but that speaks so closely to the Pakistan situation right now. We see exactly those kinds of configurations that have that have kept um, dem democracy fairly unstable or just sort of made it more difficult and is, and is sort of behind this polarization. So the question essentially is, is the, the puzzle that it leads us to is um, that these global challenges suggest a lot of similarities, but a lot of your work speaks to very different political traditions, which is essentially what we've been discussing today. Yeah. How do we begin to explain this? Yeah, I mean, I think so. So, so I, as I said at the start, I'm not sure I understand this. I can have a go at it. You know, I, I, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, I think on the face of it, there's enormous heterogeneity. You know, I, I you know, for example, take the Phil if you take the Philippines. So I've I did some work in the Philippines, and um, I never wrote anything, but we did, we did, you know, we 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 did quite a bit of field work actually in Mindanao, you know, where where President Duterte is from, and I went, we went to Davao City, where he's from, and and it's a very, it's a fascinating experience. You know, Davao City is just. You know, you can you can eat your breakfast off the pavement. You know, it's like it's absolutely orderly. It's clean. It's like it's like no city in the Philippines. So he got this reputation, you know, as being a kind of autocrat. But he provided it's like a Hobbesian Leviathan. You know, he would you know he was he's happy to admit you know he killed people. He had you know he just he created this enormously autocratic. And people in Manila said, 
oh, we'd like some of that here, you know, like, I, I mean, so that what's dry, you know, okay, and then think about Brazil, okay, so, so Bolsonaro, how, how do you think about, Bol like, why on earth is that happening in, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you look at economic development in Brazil, since the transition to democracy, 85, 1990, you could say, uh, economic performance has been absolutely terrible compared to what it was under the military dictatorship, you know, before that, you know, there was hyperinflation, there was massive corruption, everywhere in Latin America, you know, the transition to democracy in Peru, in Argentina, in Bolivia, it created hyperinflation, you know, I, you know, Mr. Modi, you know, he's like, a, he's not an accountable politician, he's a guru, you know, he's a, he posts videos of him doing yoga and feeding peacocks, you know, like, so what, what, what does all of this have in common? It, you know, it seems to me what it has in common is, it's not about globalization or, you know, it's about, it's about, it's about disappointment with democracy, it seems to me, you know, what was it that put Duterte in power in the Philippines? It was all of this optimism of, we got rid of Marcos, there's this democratic revolution, and there's so much promise. And what does democracy deliver for the average person in the Philippines? You know, what does democracy deliver for the average person in Brazil? You know, what does democracy deliver? So I think it's actually, you know, this wave of democracy. If you look at the data, of course, the world's more democratic than it's ever been in the past. But, but democracy has been very ineffective relative to people's aspirations and people's hopes, it seems to me, and people, you know, and it triggers, you know, we have a very naive idea of, which is funny, you know, because basic ideas in political theory, you know, in the theory of collective choice, for example, suggest that it's actually extremely difficult, you know, reconciling different interests in society and coming to kind of collective agreements on what to do. People have different ideas, they have different preferences, and that how do you how do you reconcile those? That that's one of the most fundamental ideas, you know, that Kenneth Arrow pointed out in the 1940s. This is actually a very very difficult problem to solve, you know. So 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 and the countries that have solved it, it took a long time for them to figure mechanisms to solve it. You know that you know there's Gordon Brown's famous joke about you know, you know I think if you look at Britain for example, there are all there are all these tacit practices and norms that kind of make this thing work and you can't develop that in five years in the philippines or in 10 years in brazil so i think you know to me that's what unites all these different experiences it's not you know i'm not an eco economic people talk a lot about inequality and you know and and globalization but I, i'm not a i'm not an economic determinist i'm a political determinist you know so i think this is about politics and about it is. It's the fact that the world is much more democratic than it ever has been in the past. But democracy can't deal with all these problems that come to the surface when you have democracy. And so this is about it's about institution building and it's about trying to figure out what's a more flexible and kind of robust way of create, you know, of dealing with these problems or allowing these problems to surface. And, and I and I and I think, you know, and the world is very, as you're saying, there's just very, very different political traditions in the world and the type of it, you know, but we have this institutional, there's this model, you know, that the West projects of what a democracy ought to look like. And that just needs to be much more flexibility in that, it seems to me. That's that's a sort of, I don't know, does that, does that make sense? We're all struggling to make sense of polarization. <laughs> yeah. I would want to, to speak. I told to you I didn't today. understand it. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is exactly why we scheduled this talk with you because we're all we're all sort of asking exactly these questions and it's really useful. Popular protest. So it allows people to, it's kind of what people thought, you know, when the Arab Spring started, there was a wave of discussion of the impact of social media on, you know, on 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 collective up, you know, collective action and protesting against autocratic regimes. I guess, you know, in the last five years in the US, we've become obsessed with. Twitter and President Trump, and it seems like the opposite is true, you know, that, and, 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 and I, you know, I think, again, you know, I tend to, my, my view is that, and, and our view, my, my view and the Asimoglu's view is that these technologies don't really have any particular implications, it's just a matter of who controls them and, 
what you do with them, you know. So, so radio, you know, if you look at the spread of radio in the 1930s in the US, you know, it's actually associated with broader distribution, the kind of more public good provision, you know, the state suddenly has to be more responsive to more people than before. But of course, Hitler bought everybody a radio, you know, in Germany, so they could listen to his speeches, you know, so, so who's in control of that, and how it's governed, I would say is sort of important. So I think most of these things have, they have more, you know, they have more inclusive aspects, and they have more kind of extractive aspects. I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think my role is, you know, is to oppose economic, um, uh, 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 you know, determinism. But, but obviously, you know, what's take, what's, what's going on here? You know, what's going on here is it, in terms of inequality and the, and the. But again, you know, this polarization of society. You know, is that is that to do with economic inequality? The interesting thing is, you know, is if you look, for example, at the Congress or the Senate and you look at people's political preferences, you know, and, and there's been this enormous sort of divergence between Republicans and, 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 and Democrats, you know, when, when, when did that, you know, when did that, when did that happen? When did that start happening? It actually started happening in the 1980s when Newt Gingrich, this who was this Republican, kind of proposed his pact with America, you know. So he came up with a sort of strategy for polarizing, the, the basically making it very difficult for Republicans to disagree, to agree or make deals with Democrats, because he thought that would increase their bargaining power. You know, like if you can commit to be like really difficult and really kind of tough, then the Democrats are going to have to make all these concessions. So it was a sort of calculated gamble in some sense to, you know, and, and look at the, the, the kind of dynamic consequences of that. So that, that was a political gamble. You know, why, why take a political gamble like that? You know, well, my, my mother, you know, my parents lived through the Second World War in England. I can tell you what my mother would have said. She lived through the Blitz in London. She'd have said, that's the, that's the sort of thing people only do when they can't understand that the world could fall apart, you know. So it's sort of, there's been this, you know, like in, for, there's, you know, like you can't imagine, you know, you, you can't imagine that this could go wrong. You know, you can't imagine that the world could fall apart, you know, and, 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 you know, but, 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 so, but the dynamic consequences of that have been absolutely dramatic. But I think that's driven by politics. It's driven by the internal dynamics of politics, not by globalization or economic inequality. That doesn't coincide with the, this, change in this pattern of political polarization in the US at least you know I mean that's I understand that's going on in lots of other contexts but but just that one case I think that's a very interesting case you know that's where all this contract with America and all these strategies for kind of polarizing the Republican base the Tea Party start start coming in we have another question in the I think we might um, sort of end with that. And this is from a current IDS student, Elaine Alam, who's been, um, um, who's speaking to a lot of the work that we've been doing at IDS actually, which is around the idea of um, shrinking civic spaces around the world and shrinking spaces for conversations and open expression um, and, and liberty. And the fact that Pakistan is, is part of the group of countries where that seems to be evolving to an extent. And her question is essentially speaking to what you said earlier about strong states and strong societies and asking about how states expect to survive when they're actively um, making collective action weaker. And she's asking specifically with regard to um, you know, weakening women's collectivities um, and other kinds of um, ethnic collectivities as well. So all si kinds of collective action. And the question, I guess, uh, essentially is, is um, how do states believe that they're becoming stronger by making their societies weaker? And what do you think, uh, where do you think states are heading through such actions? Yeah, I, I don't know that, I don't know that people, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that they think that makes the state stronger, but I think they're happy with weak states. You know, I mean, I work, I've worked, you know, I work a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, but I also, you know, I've taught, I work a lot in South America, and especially in Colombia. You know, I've taught in Bogota every summer for over 25 years, you know. And what, what's been going on in the US is very familiar, familiar to any Colombian, you know, in the last five years. 
President Trump's ideal society, you know, I think it's even more extreme than Colombia. His ideal society would be Guatemala in some sense. You know, there's no taxes in Guatemala. There's no income tax. You know, there's no taxes. There's no regulation. You can, you know, elites self-provide public goods. President Trump doesn't want a state. He doesn't want any regulation. He doesn't want taxation. He's been trying to systematically, like, de-institutionalize the federal state. You know, the entire four years he was there, he was trying to collapse the state. You know, and you know, and and that that's you know, you self provide public goods, you self provide healthcare, you self provide education, you have bodyguards, you know, you have an armor plated car. This is very common to every Colombian elite. Okay, the only thing you can't self provide in Colombia is a stable currency. You know, so you need to have some well trained American PhDs in the central bank to make sure the currency is organized. Apart from that, you can more or less do everything. You know, and. 13 families are incredibly rich. You know, GDP per capita is, you know, $3,000 in Guatemala, $6,000 in Colombia. But 13 families are incredibly rich. And you see yourself, what is President Trump? He sees himself as one of those 13 families. So I, you know, I think it's either, you know, I, that to me, like, I'm, I'm sure he's not articulate enough to, to, you know, to kind of put that view forward. But like that would be my interpretation of his idea of a sort of ideal society. That the great mass of people are completely impoverished, but he doesn't care about that. It's just about him. Everything is about him, and and you know, and about his elite friends. So I I don't think they think that they're making the state stronger. That they're happy with a weaker state, you know, because they see themselves on the top of that society, and and that's you know that's a terrifying vision, isn't it? So to wrap that up, then, what is it that societies can actually do when they're sitting in these closing civic spaces? Well, I think you, you know, <laughs> you have to organize, you know, you have to, I mean, I asked myself when all the vote counting was taking place, you know, there was this tense week where there was this committee in Michigan of two Democrats and two Republicans that had to ratify, you know, the votes, the vote totals, and everyone was talking about they're meeting on Friday, you know, what, what are they going to do? Because the Republicans could have said, you know, we're not going to do it. And then there would have been a gridlock, you know, because we're four people and they could, and then it would have gone up. You know, luckily there was a, a Democratic governor in Michigan. So, you know, so, but, but we, this is what we were talking about. This is what, you know, things have come to in the United States. But I think at the end of the day, you know, what is it that got those people to unanimously ratify the election results? It's the, it's the threat of, popular discontent and popular mobilization and popular protest. And that's what's happening now. You know, what, what is going to stop the Republicans passing all these laws, you know, disenfranchising black people and poor people? It's, it's people mobilizing and organizing. And, you know, that's the, only, that's the only real defense, it seems to me. You know, you can't rely on the judiciary or somebody interpreting. So, you know, I think that's so I understand exactly what you're saying, you know, but 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 this is a, you know, this is a, and it's easy to say something like that. But to me, I think that's the only thing ultimately that, you know, that, 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 that works or that can guarantee, you know, these liberties. Society has to be strong and it has to be organized. You know, these things are taken. They're not, they're not granted, you know. Uh, that's a really powerful idea. And um, as are our global challenges right now. Thank you so much for speaking to us about this today, James. It's been a real pleasure. And then those are really very powerful ideas you've put forth to today. Omer? Uh, no, thank you uh, once again, Professor Robinson. And uh, it's always interesting to see, uh, you know, transitions happening in terms of how people think about various problems uh, and especially sort of, you know, introducing more ideational and cultural ideas of how, uh, you know, politics actually actually works. Uh, so uh, on that note, we want to thank uh, Professor James Robinson uh, for joining us today uh, and for uh, you know, uh, giving uh, the, a great lecture on, on the book, The Naruto Corridor, which is widely available across bookshops in Pakistan. So in case you haven't already uh, uh, read a copy. Um, and uh, Shandana, any closing remarks uh, that you'd like to add to this? Uh, well, that's pretty much it from our end at the Mehbubala Research Center in collaboration with SERP, IDS, and the Institute of Development and Economic Alternatives. I hope everyone stays safe. Uh, stay, stay safe. Have a great weekend, uh, and see you all very shortly for with the with the next lecture uh, that we have planned here at MHRC. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>